Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Pathology Learning. I am Dr. Monica. In today's class, we will be seeing about chronic inflammation and a type of chronic inflammation which is granulomatous inflammation. So, chronic inflammation is a type of inflammation which is of delayed onset and of a prolonged duration. So, in this type of inflammation, we have inflammation, tissue injury and repair taking place simultaneously. So, this is the definition of chronic inflammation. So, uh, inflammatory cells which are involved in chronic inflammation will be mononuclear cells like lymphocytes and macrophages. And the most important cell of this chronic inflammation will be a macrophage. And I mentioned tissue injury is also a feature of chronic inflammation, right? So, this is the hallmark of chronic inflammation. Tissue injury is the hallmark of chronic inflammation. So, what are the causes of uh, what are the causes of chronic inflammation? Already we had seen that acute inflammation can progress on to chronic inflammation if the stimulus is being persistent or if the stimulus is difficult to eradicate. So, that is one cause. Then again in autoimmune disorders like self antigens. So, it is not possible to remove the self antigens. So, in that case chronic inflammation will be there and also in environmental antigens that is hypersensitivity reactions. So, in those cases also we get this chronic inflammation or if there is any prolonged exposure to a toxic substance like a silica. So, we will be seeing about the uh, cells which are involved in chronic inflammation starting with macrophages. So, macrophages the main important function of macrophages is phagocytosis. So, other than that uh, macrophages also function as antigen presenting cells and it is involved in the repair process and also secretion of uh, cytokines which help in maintaining the inflammatory process. So, the macrophages are derived from bone marrow monoblasts. So, from the monoblasts we get monocytes which are circulating in the peripheral blood. So, from this uh, peripheral blood when the monocytes enter into the tissue there they are called as macrophages. So, the lifespan of normal monocytes will be 1 to 3 days only but when the uh, when it becomes a macrophage it can sustain for years together also. So, in specific tissues, these macrophages are given specific names. So, let us see about that. In brain, macrophages are going to be called as microglia. In liver, they are called as Kupfer cells. While in spleen, they are called as littoral cells. In lungs, they are called as alveolar macrophages or dust cells. In kidney, they are going to be called as mesangial cells. And in placenta, they are called as Hofbauer cells. Then in synovium, it is the type A type of synovial cells which are the macrophages. Then in connective tissue, it is the histiocytes. Let us see about the types of macrophages. We have two types of macrophages basically, the classical or the M1 type, alternative and the M2 type. So, in classical uh, macrophages, the main function of this classical macrophages will be phagocytosis. So, phagocytosis is a process of inflammation. So, it is a pro-inflammatory kind of macrophage. While M2, the alternate kind of macrophage is an anti-inflammatory uh, macrophage because it is involved in the process of repair. So, how are these macrophages triggered? Let us see. So, the M1 macrophages are going to be triggered by interferon gamma. So, this interferon gamma is going to be produced by the uh, T helper cell which is the T helper subset 1. While M2 macrophages will be activated by interleukin 4 and interleukin 13. These interleukins are actually produced by the T helper cell subset 2. Okay. So, when these macrophages, when M1 macrophages is activated, it is going to produce certain cytokines of its own which are interleukin 1, interleukin 2 and interleukin 12. So, interleukin 12 is a very important uh, cytokine here because this interleukin 12 is involved in the activation of lymphocytes. So, lymphocytes are the other cells which are involved in chronic inflammation. So, interleukin 12 will activate the lymphocytes. While M2 macrophages are activated, they are going to produce certain cytokines which are interleukin 10 and TGF beta. So, already we had seen interleukin 10, TGF beta are anti-inflammatory cytokines, right? So, the function of this M2 macrophages will be anti-inflammatory and this TGF beta is responsible for the fibrosis which happens in repair. So, M2 macrophages the main function is repair. So, got it? M1 macrophages are pro-inflammatory and their main function is phagocytosis while M2 in, uh, macrophages are actually anti-inflammatory and their main function is repair. So, do remember the cytokines they produce and the cytokines which activate them. 
Moving on to the second cell which is involved in chronic inflammation that is lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are of two types, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are involved in antibody production. So, T lymphocytes are further subdivided into uh, helper cells that is CD4 positive T cells and cytotoxic cells which are CD8 positive T cells. Now, this CD4 helper T cells are the one which are involved in chronic inflammation. So, here again there are three types of or three subsets of this T helper cells the starting with T helper 1 subset 1, subset 2 and subset 17. The first subset is going to produce interferon gamma. So, like I mentioned just now, so this interferon gamma is the one which is going to activate the M1 macrophages. Then the second subset TH2 subset is going to produce interleukin 4, 5 and 13 and this is the one which is going to activate the M2 subset. While TH17 subset is going to produce interleukin 17 and this is we had already seen it is a chemo attractant for neutrophil and macrophages. There is a link between this macrophage and lymphocytes which happen. Macrophages are actually antigen presenting cells. So, when these uh, macrophages take up, encounter an antigen, they take up this antigen, process it and then it, they present it to a T lymphocyte. So, this T lymphocyte when it, uh, it is going to get activated when this interaction happens. How? Because macrophages are going to secrete interleukin 12. Remember M1 macrophages secreted interleukin 12. So, interleukin 12 will be released by this macrophages and because of this T cells are going to get activated. So, when T cells are getting activated, it will release cytokines like interferon gamma which will again activate the macrophage which is the M1 type or when they release interleukin 4 or 13, it is going to activate the M2 subtype. Okay, so it is a cycle which goes on macrophage activates lymphocyte, lymphocytes activate macrophage. So, remember this. So, this is the basics of chronic inflammation. So, next we will see about a specific type of chronic inflammation which is granulomatous inflammation. So, this granulomatous inflammation is a type of chronic inflammation only but it has a specific morphology that is it is composed of certain kind of modified macrophages called as epithelioid macrophages. So, epithelioid macrophages are nothing but modified macrophages surrounding which we have a collar of lymphocytes. So, this is the classical image of the granuloma, granuloma. So, in the center in this picture we are seeing necrosis. So, this necrosis is not necessary for a granuloma. It can be present or may not be present also. If it is present, it is usually in our country characteristic of tuberculous inflammation. So, surrounding this necrosis, we see certain cells which are called as epithelioid macrophages. So, these are uh, nothing but modified macrophages which have abundant cytoplasm. So, they resemble an epithelial cell. So, that is why they have got the term uh, epithelioid macrophages because they resemble the epithelial cells. Apart from that, there is a specific feature which is present in this epithelioid macrophages that is it has a slipper shaped nucleus. So, this slipper shaped nucleus is the characteristic uh, finding of an epithelioid macrophage. And the function of this epithelioid macrophage is secretory function that is secretion of the uh, cytokines rather than phagocytosis. Whenever the inside is quite difficult to eradicate that is when this granulomatous inflammation takes place. So, uh, we also have this multinucleated giant cells. So, the big big cells we see here. No? So, these are the multinucleated giant cells. So, these are nothing but the fused epithelioid macrophages only. So, they have this multiple nuclei and in TB we have a specific type of multinucleated giant cell called as Langhans giant cell. So, Langhans giant cell is seen in tuberculosis. Here, the nucleus is going to be arranged in the periphery like a horseshoe shaped. Okay. We will be seeing that in detail again. Uh, so, the classical image of a granuloma is center, it can have necrosis or it may not have. Surrounding that, we are going to have epithelioid macrophages. Then again, surrounding that, we are going to have a collar of lymphocytes. And when this granuloma is going to be very chronic and persistent, it can even lead to fibrosis which is walling of this granuloma. Okay. So, this is the characteristic image of a uh, granuloma. Next, we will see about the types of granulomatous inflammation. We have various causes of granulomatous uh, granuloma formations. So, we will see the causes of it. We can divide it into infective causes and non-infective causes. In our country, whenever you see a granuloma, the first the differential which has to come to your mind is tuberculosis. So, tuberculosis, they have a central caseating kind of necrosis. 
Other than that, we have leprosy, which is again caused by mycobacterium leprae. Then in syphilis, this granuloma is going to be uh, called as gamma. In malaria, the granulomas are called as Dirk's granuloma. While in cat scratch disease caused by Bartonella hanselae, so here the granulomas are called as stellate granulomas because they are star shaped. Then in Q fever, we have a fibrin ring or a donut ring granuloma. Then there is other fungal infections like histoplasmosis, blastomycosis and coccidiomycosis which are also uh, causative agents for causing a granuloma. So these are the infective causes of granuloma while the non-infective causes include sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is a granuloma in which there is no caseation and it is called as a naked granuloma because there will be no lymphocyte collar seen around this. So it is full of this epithelioid macrophages only. So that is a characteristic image we see in a sarcoid granuloma. In Crohn's disease as well, there is non-caseating granulomas. Remember, uh, Crohn's disease is then part of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but in ulcerative colitis, which is the other form of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, there is no granulomas. Only in Crohn's disease of IBD, we have granuloma formation and that is non-caseating granuloma. Other than that, in certain type of vasculitis also, we can have granulomas like temporal arthritis, Takayasu arthritis, Wiegner's granulomatosis that is also called as granulomatosis with polyangitis and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis which is also called as Schirk-Strauss syndrome. So remember this table which is very important uh, MCQs. So these are the various examples of granulomatous inflammation. So let's see some image based questions related to this. So the first image is that of a stellate granuloma. So can you see? This is a forming a star like appearance. So this is why it is called as a stellate granuloma and it is characteristically seen in cat scratch disease. And here the granulomas are actually formed by neutrophils rather than chronic inflammatory cells. So remember that as well it is a separative inflammatory granuloma. The second and the third images are that of a Dirk's granuloma which we see in cerebral malaria. So, in cerebral malaria, the parasitized RBCs are present inside the vessel. So, this is the vessel. Inside this, if you see the RBCs, along with that, you can see some brown brown dots. So, that are nothing but parasitized RBCs only. So, surrounding that, we can see this inflammatory response, which is forming a vague granuloma. So, that is what we call as a Dirk's granuloma, which is seen in a cerebral malaria. The last image here is that of a fibrin ring or a donut granuloma. Doesn't it look like a donut here? So the central uh, empty space is nothing but a fat filled vacuole around which we have this uh, fibrin kind of material and inflammatory cells which is forming this granuloma. So it is seen in many conditions but the best example of this fibrin ring granuloma will be Q fever condition. Okay. So we had seen about the various causes of granulomatous inflammation along with their images. Now we will see about uh, the types of giant cells. Already I had mentioned about the Langhans type of giant cell, right? So we will see about further types of giant cell which are again important MCQs. So uh, we have physiological type of giant cells and pathological kind of giant cells. Under physiological giant cells, we have osteoclastic cells, megakaryocytes and syncytiotrophoblasts present in the placental villi. So under pathological giant cells, we have the first one will be Langhans giant cell. So remember, it is not Langerhans giant cell, okay. Langerhans cell is an entirely different cell which is a dendritic cell present in skin. This is Langerhans giant cell characteristic of a tuberculous inflammation. Here, if you, are, see, if you can see, this is the cell and the nucleus is all arranged peripherally in a horseshoe kind of an arrangement. So that is how a Langerhans giant cell will appear. The second type of giant cell is a two turns giant cell. Here, the cytoplasm is going to be vacuolated and the nucleus is all going to be arranged in the center like a flower. And inside this flower, we are going to have the cytoplasmic material. So, this is the giant cell. This is the cytoplasm. Here, the nucleus is arranged in a central part, center. Uh, and the center part is again composed of the cytoplasm. And this is characteristically seen in xanthomas. The third type of giant cell is a foreign body giant cell. Any foreign body is being uh, taken up like suture material, talc material or even some uh, silica particles. So around this, the giant cells will be forming trying to uh, eat up this foreign material. 
So these foreign body giant cells have multiple nuclei and here the nuclei is all haphazard. They don't have a proper arrangement. So these are all haphazard arrangement of nu uh, nucleuses present. The fourth type of giant cell will be a warthin fingaldi giant cell. It is a very important MCQ. Again, it is seen in measles condition. So in this we can see the intranuclear inclusion. Can you see some dark pinkish uh, material inside the nucleus? So it is intranuclear inclusion seen in a warthin fingaldi giant cell characteristic of measles infection. So the next last image is that of a reed sternberg kind of giant cell which we see in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the classical image of this reed sternberg giant cell is what we call as owl's eye appearance. Why? Because here the nucleus is going to be binucleated and it is looking like a mirror image. So this is one half and this is one another half. So binucleate mirror image with a prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. So prominent eosinophilic nucleoli is present in reed sternberg kind of giant cell. So in this video we had seen about what are the cells involved in uh, chronic inflammation starting from the various types of macrophages. They are special names given. Then M1 and M2 macrophages, the interleukins being produced by them, they are function. Then we saw about the granulomatous inflammation, the various causes of granulomatous inflammation along with image based questions. Then the various type of giant cells. So multiple MCQs are there in this video. So do uh, remember it. So that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching. If you like my content, consider subscribing and sharing it to your friends who might also benefit from my video. Thank you.